Coffee is the name of a little pet house finch that uh, lives in a house with their owners, lives in a cage with a, a nest mate named Charlie. But Coffee runs into a serious problem every once in a while. Her, her claws on her feet grow so long that she sometimes loses control of them and, and they get caught up in things. She gets caught up in her nest or different things and, uh, and needs, needs some assistance. One time her owners found her almost dead, hanging upside down for, for hours, as far as they could tell, from her, from her nest and just couldn't get herself free from that. Uh, they found her in time and nursed her back to health, but uh, they found from that time that, that they need to regularly take this little bird and, and clip its long claws so that uh, she doesn't run into this problem again. When it's time for them to do this, they have to reach into her cage, and she doesn't like that. She will fly every which way to all eight corners of this cage to try and escape from, from the hands, escape capture. But once her owners do finally get a hold of her, they, they grasp her firmly but, but gently in their hands, and, and they can feel her heart beating a mile a minute and her trying to escape and struggle and, and peck at the hand to try and get herself free. But the owners hold her steady and eventually clip her nails and release her back into the safety of their cage where she can fly and sing happily for a number of months before they have to go through all this process again. Her owners say this, It's sad when she distrusts me. Charlie, Coffee's nestmate, seems to enjoy being held and stroked, simply receiving the care for what it is as we clip his nails. And then the owners ask this question. I'm just going to leave that there. <laughs> then they ask this question. Who are you more like when God gets a hold of you, when God gets you in His grip and needs to do some trimming, needs to do some work in your life? Are you like coffee, who struggles and fights and, and tries to resist it? Or are you more like Charlie, who can receive rest and care, even when it's scary or even painful? Surrender is at the heart of all of our lives as followers of Jesus. We talk about Jesus being our Lord and our Savior. As we talk about Jesus being our Savior, He's the one who, who paid the price for us. But even the act of receiving that free gift of, of salvation is an act of surrender. It's coming to the end of ourselves and, and realizing that, that I can't do this myself. I can't save myself. I can't be good enough by myself to, to earn this salvation or to make this, this, this sin in my life disappear or be paid for. And so we surrender ourselves to Him when we're saved. But the whole idea of Jesus being our Lord, that's also about surrender. It's about saying yes to His plans and His purposes for us and saying no to ourselves. It's about acknowledging who He is and who we are in Him. And so surrender really is at the heart of who we are if we're followers of Jesus. He really can't be our Lord or our Savior if we've not surrendered ourselves to Him. If we haven't said no to ourselves and yes to Him. And this morning we're going to take a few minutes and look at, at this idea of, of lordship and surrender. The idea of lordship really means that, that we've willingly chosen to be submissive to someone else. To another authority. And so for us to say that Jesus is Lord, He's the Lord of my life, it means that I've submitted myself to His authority. What He says goes. What He wants is what I choose to want. Saying no to what I might choose for myself or want for myself. As a starting point for looking more fully at the idea of surrender, we're going to look more closely at this passage from Exodus that the Barry just read. Very familiar passage to us, the first section really of the Ten Commandments that we can probably all recite the Ten Commandments in one translation or another, but there's, there's things that we, we miss or we skip over if we don't slow down and really see what's there. Even before God gets into what the command is, He starts off with two things. Look at what He says right there at the very beginning of verse 2. <clears throat> I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt 
the place of your slavery. So the first thing he does is he, he reminds his people of his position. He reminds them of who he is. That he is Yahweh. He is, he is Elohim. He's the Lord. He's the Master. That's who he is. He, he starts off the, all these Ten Commandments reminding them of who he is and his position as God, as Lord, as, as King, as the one who's in authority. He's Yahweh. He's the one true God, the only God, who's entered into this relationship with his people by, by a covenant that he's entered into with them. That he would be their God and they would be his people. They would be his possession and he would be their God. So he points out his position. But then he also reminds them that he's also their deliverer. Not only is he God, but he's the one who saved them. He's the one who delivered them out of Egypt. And as we talk about what it means to surrender to God, think about this idea of who's sitting on the throne of our lives and think about lordship, those are the two starting places for us too. We need to start with recognizing who it is that we're talking about, who God is, what his position is, and then what he's done for us. That he is the Lord, that he is the master, and that he is our, our savior and our deliverer. Those are the starting points. And we need to acknowledge God for who he is, not for who we'd want him to be, not for who we wish he was, but for who he actually is. And then the passage goes on to describe some of the dynamics of this, this relationship. This, this relationship that starts with him being sovereign, him being Lord, and him being deliverer. And we see that in the first, in really verse 3. You must not have any other God but me. You must not have any other God but me. No other gods, some translations say no other gods before me. Now, does that mean that, that God is to be the, the head God above all these other little gods? That, that God is someone we can kind of add into all the other gods in our lives? Because when you look at some of the translations, it almost says that. You may not have any other gods before me. So people might get the idea that, that there's, and especially in Old Testament times, there were all kinds of different gods. And, and people got the idea that they could add God into it as long as they put him at the top place. Kind of this idea of a, of a triangle, of a, of a hierarchy. As long as Yahweh is at the top of this triangle, we don't need to get rid of these other gods. But God established that He is the only God. That's how He starts out. He reminds them that, that He is the Lord. That He's the only one. There, there are no other gods. There are no other gods in that pyramid. He's not just the God who's in first place. He's the only God in the only place. To apply this personally, we use this image of, of the idea of a throne in our lives. There's only one throne in your life and in my life. We don't have a whole bunch of different thrones that, that reign and govern over different areas. We have one throne in our lives. And so we come back to the question of who is it that's sitting in that throne? Is God sitting in that throne? Have we accepted His authority? Have we said yes to Him and submitted to Him? Or is someone or something else sitting in that throne? As our Creator, God knows that we have this desire to worship. He knows it because He made us with that desire. And it's His desire that, that, that we have this close, intimate relationship together. He also knows that if we're not careful and if we're not intentional, that, that we're easily distracted and that we can put other things in front of him. That we can let other things or people or relationships or whatever they are, we can let them take the place, his place in our lives. And so he reminds us, no other gods. No one takes my place. That's the first and the first commandment that he says there. The second thing that we see there is in verse 3. Actually, verse 4. 
You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for other gods. So not only are we to not have other gods in the place, in His place, in His presence, we're not to, to fashion or, or, or have other, other things that, that represent anything else. And that was a very literal thing in those days. It was, it was a very literal thing for them to have a little, a little statue or a big statue or whatever and something that they, they actually could look to and see and, and worship as God. You know, it's interesting to note that shortly after this passage is written, this, this Exodus 20, we see in Exodus 32, um, already they've started to stray away from this. And the Israelites were at the foot of the mountain making a, a gold calf to worship. They thought Moses was dead. And already they had strayed away. And you know, we can look at that message and we can say, you know, how foolish were they? Look at all the things God had already done for them. Look at how God had already revealed himself to those people, and yet they so quickly turn away. How, how foolish, how blind they are. And we can pat ourselves on the backs for not, not worshiping false gods. But let's not fool ourselves. Because while there might be some faiths today that, that worship gods made by human hands, um, we're also guilty of fashioning idols in different ways though. Anything that puts God out of His proper place in our lives is a false god or an idol. Anything that takes the place of God sitting on the throne of our lives is something that's an idol. Is something that's, that becomes a false god to us. How do we identify these false gods? How do we identify anything in our, in our lives that is maybe pushing God out of His place or we're allowing to take the place of God? Here's a couple of questions that might help us to identify those. What gets in the way of your growing personal relationship with God? What are the things that, that seem to interfere with us having a growing personal relationship with God? Because if we're not devoted to spending time with God, to knowing Him, to learning from Him, to being in His Word, and growing in that, in that personal, intimate relationship with Him, then there's something else that's in God's place. There's something that's there that's, that's blocking us, that's stopping us. And someone looking at us from the outside in might might look at us and describe our personal relationship with God as being a relationship of, con of convenience. We run back to Him when we need Him. We turn to Him when there's a problem. But in our normal everyday lives, He's not sitting on that throne. The second question is this, that might be an indication of things that, that are distracting us, that are, that are sitting on the throne of our lives. What inhibits you from faithfully serving God in your church? Because if we're followers of Jesus, God has given us gifts and abilities that He's called us to use in His church. And He, he calls us and He expects us to do that. Each one of us, you and me, have different gifts, different abilities, different callings on our lives. We have a calling to, to be the hands and feet of Jesus for people. We have a calling to to be out in the world and spreading the good news of Jesus and inviting people to know Him. He's called us in lots of different areas. But if we're not being faithful to God and using the gifts that He's entrusted to us for, for the, the building up of His church, then I think we've somehow allowed a false god to sit on that throne. We're not walking in obedience to Him. And so we need to identify those things in our lives that become false gods. Those things that have knocked God out of His proper place. Whether it be self, and that can include things like pride, fear, or apathy. It can be things like sleep, or our, or our health, or, or sports, or family even. Jobs and careers. There's all kinds of things that can, that can put... God out of His place and be sitting on the throne of our lives. The third thing that we see here, we see in verse 5. And it's a command not to bow down. 
We already read the verse, so I'm not going to read it again, but it talks about not fashioning other, other images and then not bowing down to them. You must not bow down to them or worship them. In Mark 8, 34-38, we see Jesus seeing this. It says, Then He called the crowd to Him along with His disciples and said, Whoever wants to be My disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow Me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for Me and for the Gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in His Father's glory with the holy angels. And so Jesus talks about dying to ourselves. And as we have Jesus on the throne, God on the throne of our lives, He's the one that we bow down to, but if we put other things and other people or other relationships or whatever it is on that place and bow to them, then we're worshiping them. Then we're not surrendering. We're not crucifying ourselves daily, as Jesus talks about. We need to be willing to lose all those things, even our very lives, out of our worship for Him. Allowing idols and false gods in our lives, knocks God's place, knocks God out of His rightful place in our lives. Bruce Larson in his book called uh, Believe and Belong, he tells how people that he helps uh, struggling to surrender their lives to Christ, he lives in New York City, and his, his call is that an evangelist where he's leading people to Jesus. And he says this, He says, for many years I worked in New York City and counseled at my office any number of people who were wrestling with this yes-no decision. Often I would suggest they walk with me from my office down to the RCA building on Fifth Avenue. In the entrance of that building is a gigantic statue of Atlas, the beautifully proportioned man who with all of his muscle straining is, is holding the world on his shoulders. There he is, the most powerfully built man in the world, And he can barely stand up under his burden. Now that's one way to live, I would point out to my companion, trying to carry the world on your shoulders. But now come across the street with me. On the other side of Fifth Avenue is St. Patrick's Cathedral. And there behind the high altar is a little shrine of the boy Jesus, perhaps eight or nine years old. And with no effort, he's holding the world up in one hand. My point was illustrated graphically. We have a choice. We can carry the world on our shoulders or we can say, I give up, Lord. I give you my world, my whole world. For you and I, true lordship, if we say that Jesus is Lord, and if we sing those words and if we believe those words, it requires surrender, genuine surrender saying no to ourselves, being willing to to die to ourselves, die to our desires, and putting to death anything in our lives that threatens to take the place of God on the throne of our lives. What false gods, what things in your life threaten to take that place? Is God on the throne of your life? Is he on the throne of my life? If he's not, what is sitting or who is sitting in his place? Let's pray. God, you are Lord and you are King and you're the only true God. And God, while there are not other literal gods, in this world, other literal spiritual beings that are gods, there's things that we allow to become gods in our lives. God, show us. Reveal to us the things that threaten Your place. God, we want You to be on the throne of our lives. We want You to be sovereign. We want You to be our Lord. We want to surrender to You. 
But God, You know us. You know that we're fragile. You know that we're easily distracted. And we easily come to the place where we put other things or people there. God, I pray for each one here that, that You would show us what You're calling us to do. What change You're calling us to make so that You will always be sitting in that throne. So that You'll always be the only God in our lives. That there will be no other gods before You. In Jesus' name, Amen.